So welcome everyone uh, to our webinar, Backward Chaining Approaches to Gain Skills to Get Down and Up from the Floor, Avoid Long Lies, Reduce Fear, and Enjoy a Bath Again, um, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Shamiza Allard, and I'm the Knowledge Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, aka ONF. Um, ONF sponsors the Fall Prevention Community of Practice, Loop and Loop Junior, and the annual Fall Prevention Month campaign. So you should see um, my screen share right now. So before we begin, begin, I'd like to give you a rundown on the Loop, the Zoom meeting platform rather. Your screen may look a bit different depending on the type of computer you are using. So if your screen, um, if your Zoom application is open in the full screen, you can double click or press the escape button on your keyboard to exit the full screen. Um, there, you should also see a button on the top right corner that says exit full screen. So I'm just circling it right there. So on this slide, you can see it, hopefully. And the webinar technology consists of two parts, um, audio and visual. So both audios and visuals are provided through your computer monitor and speaker. So to test or adjust your audio settings, look for the audio settings or join button in the bottom left of your screen. So I'm circling it there. This, this will provide options for testing your computer microphone and speakers. So if you look to the bottom center of your screen, you will see buttons that will allow you to access the chat box, raise your hand, and the Q&A features on Zoom. So the chat box allows you to send messages to the webinar presenters and other webinar participants. Um, you can use the raise hand button if you want to connect with me uh, through the chat box and you can also submit questions through the Q&A box. You will only be able to view questions that you have asked, not questions posed by other participants. Um, if you need to leave the webinar at any time, click the red leave meeting button on the bottom right corner of your screen, so right there. So if you have questions about the technology at any time during this presentation, um, please, type it in, please type them in the chat box or use the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. My colleague uh, Marguerite and I will be monitoring these. So alternatively, you can also email me at shimiza.allard at onf.org. I've included my contact information in the chat box and I'll work with you to resolve any technical issues as soon as possible. So the webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation, presentation slides, so stay tuned. So now I'd like to introduce you to our presenters, Don and Bex. So Don Skelton is an exercise physiologist with a scientific research background. She is a professor in aging at health and health at Glasgow Caledonian University. She chaired the Royal Osteoporosis Society's statement on exercise and osteoporosis and the older people panel for UK's update of the physical activity for health guidelines. She works part-time in academia and the rest of the time is a director of Later Life Training, a not-for-profit training company. She recently received the British Geriatric Society Marjorie Warren Lifetime Achievement Award for her work in translating fall prevention research into practice. Bex Townley is an exercise specialist of UK's training framework. In her 30 years of working within the fitness sector, her job roles have included the following setting up and delivering of evidence-based exercise continuums for people with long-term conditions and fall prevention. She has experience of working in the area across all sectors and setter, settings and in partnership with referring health professionals as part of agreed referral pathways. Bex is a director, tutor, and assessor for Later Life Training, leading on Later Life Training's development product, products and along with the director, team consult on a range of national projects across the UK. Without further ado, please take it away, Dawn and Bex. You may now share your screen. Hello, everybody. Um, looking forward to uh, carry on with this. And we, I'm just pulling up my PowerPoint. Here we go. So this is a, a, a double action um, webinar. So I'm starting off and Bex is going to follow through. Um, we'll try and ask, answer some questions as we go through. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the chat box, but if not, we'll follow through with any questions afterwards. Um, so really, we're all about trying to uh, make sure you're confident and uh, happy to talk to older people about getting up off the floor, maybe even skill them up a bit to do it a bit better and possibly help them if they've had a fall. So those are the three sort of main things we're going to cover uh, today. 
And I'm going to start off, though, just to make sure that we adapt to suit our audience with a, a poll, um, just to check out what your expertise or experience is, um, because then we can perhaps, um, as I say, tailor our presentation a little bit more. So if you could uh, tick which one of these best applies to you, that would be fantastic. Give you a, about 30 seconds or so to do that. Um, and then Shariza will share the results uh, with us. I see some of you are mentioning on the chat box that you are not able to click, um, but it looks like we've got a, a mix of physios and occupy. Ah, here we go. We've got 43% physios, 20% occupational therapists, smaller number of exercise instructors, nurses, and clinicians. Perhaps in the chat box, some of you others could tell us who you are. That would be great. Thanks, Shamiza. Okay, I've got one more poll for you, um, which is this one. I'd now like to have an idea of which work setting you're in. Again, just to give us an idea so we can tailor a bit more as we're going through. So again, I'm gonna ask you to tick uh, acute hospital setting, whether it's in the care home setting, community. And I'll just leave that running for a few seconds. Fantastic. So we've got a huge range going on there. Um, so we've got, uh, looks like the majority of you are from the community setting, but we have a range from everywhere else. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Shamiza. Okay. So a little bit of background before we move into some of the research behind backward chaining and really the stuff you're interested in is how do we work with it? Um, we all know it's important to get up off the floor. Um, I'm sure if you think back to the last year, uh, probably about a third of you have fallen for a variety of reasons and you bounce back up very quickly, look around a bit embarrassed and get on with things. So we don't even think about that. It's just something that inherently we can do. But what we are well aware of, I'm sure, is that once we get older, it's harder and many people can't get up. And sadly, there's a fair amount of research to suggest that anything more than an hour on the floor, irrespective of any other injury, will lead to poor outcomes. Um, some work by, uh, in Cambridge in the UK showed an increased risk of hospitalisation, poor recovery of physical function and an increased possibility of admission to residential care facilities. Sadly, if somebody is particularly falls in a cold area on a cold floor and lies there for a long time, the increased chance of pneumonia, hypothermia and other complications which can lead to death. In the UK, many ambulance services pick people up, dust them off, put them back in their chair and don't take them into hospital. Um, it's, it's about 40% of older people who fall and who the ambulance services go to are not taken into hospital. This of course is a huge cost to the ambulance services, means those ambulances aren't free for others, but more importantly, those older people's dignity is affected. If we were able to retrain that, that would be very helpful. The cost in the UK alone in 2012 was associated around about 75 and a half million pounds and is projected to rise to nearly 119 million just for sending out ambulances to pick people up. It's a little bit lower in Australia, about 30% of older recipients of community care services are taken, uh, picked up by the ambulance crew, but not taken into hospital. The issue about somebody having to wait for someone to pick them up is essentially they have an increased fear of falling afterwards. It becomes a, a big issue for them. And something called post-fall syndrome or depression, avoidance of activity, um, general uh, isolation, they don't want to go somewhere just in case, all of these things can become a bit of a vicious circle. 
So what is backward chaining? Well, my idol in all of this is Janet Simpson, a physiotherapist in the UK, who back in 1993 did a, a survey and found that only 11% of physiotherapists that work with older people taught them how to get it back up off the floor or even checked they could. A couple of years later, um, they looked again and found that about 19% of potential fallers were perfectly capable of being taught how to rise with just one session. Um, and before she talked about backward chaining, uh, this method that we're going to talk to you about today, the actual method was just to lower the person to the ground in the physiotherapy clinic and then ask them to rise, not give them any suggestion, um, but basically uh, just sort of see if they could do it. So it's been about 20 years now that the backward chaining approach has been part of usual physiotherapy practice. But I've got that question, is it? <laughs> because actually in the UK, we often find when you speak to physiotherapists, they're still not doing this with older adults. So some of the work about getting up off the floor. Again, Jane Fleming and Carol Brain in Cambridge looked at their large cohort of over 90s. They've been following this cohort for some years. 80% of them couldn't rise after a fall and a third would lay there for more than an hour. So obviously this is the oldest old um, and the ones which we are probably more likely to expect to be unable to rise. But they did a little check and found that the inability to rise was associated, of course, with increased age. And this is in the over 90s because the cohort went up to 104. Um, those that were unable to rise also tended to report more mobility problems and have more severe cognitive impairment. Certainly poor cognition predicts long lies. They found that those that had a lie of more than an hour more likely to go into hospital or move into residential care. And interestingly, although the vast majority of them had fall alarms, they were rarely used, literally less than 10% of the time. And I think you again might come across this in practice. Many older people don't want to press it because they perhaps think they're gonna be able to get up a bit later on, perhaps don't want to be a burden. But the issue is if they can't rise, they have poor outcomes. Some work in Germany in 2016 also looked at the uh, predictors of a slow rise or an inability to rise. Uh, and they found that those people that had more trouble had lower limb power issues, so much lower in, in muscle power and poor hip and knee flexibility. Nothing new there, nothing unexpected, I guess. So the first study to look at the percentage of non-injured fallers that couldn't get up was Mary Tonetti's back in 1993. They were older and had poorer balance and about 47% couldn't get up after a fall. More recent work has looked again at asking people if they can and then looking at the actual test of whether they can. So a self-report versus an actual test. And 90% correctly identify their own ability to get up off the floor. That does mean 10% won't. <laughs> uh, and that's one of the questions we've already been asked. Uh, if people are confident and get down and then can't get up again, what do we do? And we'll, we'll discuss that a bit later on. And this year, Ardali looked at a, a variety of different ways of predicting inability to floor rise. And just as Fleming had shown, the older they were, the more help they needed during activities of daily living. If they were a frequent faller, if they needed two-handed assistive devices, i.e. frames or zimmers, or if they were housebound, they were more likely to be unable to get up. Again, nothing uh, new there. They recommended a backward chaining approach. And in Norway, we've got some work by Astrid Bergland, again, looking at ability to rise off the floor and found it was an independent risk factor for a serious fall-related injury later on in the follow-up. So someone who's unable to get up off the floor is more likely later on to have an injurious fall. Those with arthritis or arthrosis of the hip and difficulty walking indoors are more likely to be unable to rise. And a third of those that were unable to rise would have a serious fall related injury in the next 12 months. So it's a good time to intervene if you find out they can't get up. So just a little bit now about the UK context. I won't spend too long on this because you're not all from the UK, but the first time we had proper guidelines um, for physiotherapists to remind people 
or remind physiotherapists to look at getting up off the floor was our 2012 guidelines. And as you can see, they were expected to teach and practice how to get up from the floor when possible. Our National Institute of Clinical Excellence also suggests that people should always be asked. If they're asked then, and they can't, they should be given some examples or shown how to. And interestingly, the information for the public is also about asking how they can be, regain uh, the ability to get up off the floor. So it's pushing uh, information to the public to make sure that they're uh, treated with respect by the people that work with them. And this year, we have the uh, Physiotherapy Works document from the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, which again reminds physiotherapists to teach people how to get up from the floor. So how do we do that? Some intervention work. Um, I looked at this back many years ago um, when I was doing some pure strength training. Um, and some of the tests I was looking at were things like getting up off the floor, ability to get out of a chair, lift weights, or lift your shopping bags. And actually found that strength training of the lower limbs on its own does not improve the ability to floor rise. It was only when I then did another study the following year where we mimicked uh, backward chaining in the exercise programming, uh, as you'll see from Bex later. And obviously at that point, we saw a significant improvement uh, in ability of people to get up off the floor. Hoffmeyer looked at six sessions over two weeks, uh, delivering training to get up off the floor. And again, saw a very good improvement. Uh, Reese and Simpson, again, the Janet Simpson, looked at conventional methods versus the new backward chaining method in a study. And it was fascinating because they actually had to stop the study because the conventional method of just putting them on the floor and asking them to get up, patients were so fearful that they didn't want to do it at all. And in 2006, Marek Zak in Poland compared the conventional method in Poland, which was rolling onto four point kneel moving to kneel standing and then standing versus the backward chaining approach and found the backward chaining approach more effective. So there's been a very recent systematic review looking at this um, by uh, Elise Burton in Australia and there were 41 studies included. So a lot of studies do look at floor ability after exercise and the meta-analysis subgroup showed that upper and lower limb resistance training will help and that focusing on training the task will make a difference as well. So part of the reason for including that in the FAME program, which is a, a well-known falls prevention exercise program, Susie and myself back in uh, 1998 really just wanted to see if we could do something about avoiding long lies. We felt that if people had the ability to get up again off the floor, they would be less fearful, more confident to go out and do things and of course, improve functionability around the home. More importantly, get back into the bath. It, at that point was a key component of physiotherapy guidelines. Just a quick slide on the um, FAME evidence. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but it has been shown to reduce falls rate and falls risk, increases habitual physical activity, probably because of improved confidence and physical function, and of course, regains the skills to get up off the floor. Sadly, last year we had an implementation study of FAME, looking at it in the real world, and we found that fidelity wasn't, wasn't too bad, actually. So this is not a research trial, not a research active delivering uh, physiotherapists and exercise instructors, but just real world delivery. And the fidelity was between 70 and 80 percent. But the main reason for not being uh, not keeping fidelity to the original FAME program was the lack of confidence to deliver floor work. So many exercise classes didn't do floor work. Whole variety of barriers told to us. Uh, there were no hoists available, dirty floors, no time to do it. Not everybody in the group are ready for it. The group's too big. And of course, what happens if they can't get up? So most of this is all about the confidence of the person delivering the exercise program, uh, rather than the, uh, the persons in front of them not necessarily wanting to do. Although the way in which you present that information is important because most people are quite fearful that they're not going to be able to get up. So I'm just going to do two more polls quickly before I hand on to Bex to give you some real life examples of what backward chaining is. And this poll 
is if you routinely ask people who've fallen if they can get up. And so I just need you to tick yes or no, or if you don't have that sort of role, you can tick not applicable. Okay, so uh, if we could have the results of that, Shamiza. Okay, so about half of you routinely do ask. That's pretty good. Um, and I'm going to, uh, thanks for that, Shamiza, I'm going to move on. Compare that to what we've got in the UK, which is a resounding 81% apparently. So whether that's because we've got guidelines in place and we've been pushing it for some time, but there does seem to be a bit of a discrepancy. Uh, this was physiotherapists only for the UK though. And the next poll is whether you routinely teach older people to get up from the floor. And so again, if we could have a poll for that. <coughs> Fantastic, thank you, Shabiza. Let's see what we've got for that. Okay, a smaller number, about or oh, less than 20%, although obviously not applicable to many of you. And I see that sometimes has got quite a lot, 30%, 34%. And that, of course, is very much likely to be dependent on the person in front of you, I'm sure. Uh, thanks, Shamiza. And I will again compare that with the UK, where about 45% would teach uh, and about 20% sometimes. So we do appear to have a, a little bit uh, more of a positive um, role for backward chaining in the UK compared to other places at the moment. So let's see if we can make you feel more confident about doing that wherever you are. Um, so I'm going to move on now and pass you to Bex, who is going to talk to you about what backward chaining actually looks like. Hello folks, uh, thanks Dawn. Uh, let me just switch over. So in the next uh, 20 minutes really, I want to give you a, a whistle stop tour of this backward chaining approach that we've talked about. Uh, we're gonna look at it as a, as a link by link analysis and that's really important. Uh, I don't know what kind of space you're in at the moment. Um, the only way to, to really get to grips with this and, and, and understand it is to, is to feel it. So if you have any room to roll around on the floor as we speak and look at this video, that would be great. Uh, so we're just gonna look at uh, uh, the whole movement, the whole sequence from uh, getting down to the floor and back up again. It's important to note this is a, an approach, a backward chaining approach can be applied to to lots of different movement sequences. It just so happens we're talking about rise from floor skills today. So we're gonna review each link uh, and then review it again with the skill up considerations. Uh, when I talk about skill up, I'm really talking about how to best prepare someone to, to be able to perform this skill. And interestingly, as I was looking at the, um, those of you that were kind of telling us your work settings, I think already we're going to see that there's a there's a range of you that will have opportunities to skill this skill up uh, up against those in care settings or acute settings where really this is a, a reactive response and how can we support this person uh, back up again? So um, I'm coming from the, the skill up um, side of things um, and hopefully within that there'll be some kind of reactive solutions as well. Um, we're going to look at some um, kind of solutions as well, some other solutions of how we, we may uh, be able to get up from the floor. As Dawn's mentioned briefly, and I'm sure you're all aware, uh, there are many barriers as to why participants uh, don't want to kind of partake in this activity. Um, but I think it's also important to mention that we, the instructors or the therapists, or the professionals also have our barriers also mentioned by Dawn. This could be anything from uh, risks that they can't get up, maybe no uh, staff or colleagues on hand, um, painful knees, hands, hips and concerns generally with being stuck on the floor within the work environment. This next point is, is critical and I'm going to come back to it and it's, it, it's really that this is an approach that assumes the mastery of one link before moving on to the next. Uh, and I put here, so technically it's always a win-win if we're working in the context of preparing people and teaching people to master this skill. 
So when we talk about backward chaining, it's a series of links. And if we understand each link, that better informs us about how we can skill up, improve mobility, flexibility, uh, strength, power, etc. Most critical to this and kind of identifying where people are in their journey, are they able to asking that initial question, can you rise from the floor? When was the last time you were on the floor? Is understanding what their start point might be in this in the in these links of the chain so we need to know a are they able to get up from the floor without concern with ease uh, if yes if no how far can we go in that process what is the start point we're going to watch uh, a short video uh, it's short about a minute and, and 40 seconds um, the first time uh, we're going to watch it through in silence and i'm sure many of you have seen this before um, but just to have a look at it this time and in your mind, um, just identify what are the links that you're already teaching or using, or if it's the first time that you've seen it in this format, just kind of consider what I've just said about the links of a chain and how we might skill up each link. So what are the links of this movement sequence? And then we'll run through it again um, and I'll give my kind of running dialogue of that. Okay, so that's the whole sequence as per the therapy-led approach and the research that Dawn's already presented to you. I think it's important to say at this point, of course, there are other ways to get up from the floor uh, and sometimes we need to be more inventive and resourceful. Uh, but for now, we're looking at this as the context of how to skill up this therapy-led approach, how to look at each of these links and understand how we can better prepare people to learn, learn the skill. So let's look through this again with, the, with my uh, running commentary. First part is this hip walk. This is critical uh, and links directly to our bum walking on the floor, links directly with our uh, bed mobility transfer skills. Sit to stand goes without saying, so I need to be confident to, to do my sit to stand. And then this bit here is critical. So um, if you are teaching this uh, exercise instructors specifically, the distance between us and the piece of furniture is, is critical. Because once I place that front foot, I'm looking for it to stay there to really optimize that base of support and, and help me with the, with the next links. Down to box position, so this was a one knee to floor, quickly followed by the second one. So we're moving through each transition fairly quickly. Uh, at this point here, I'm now preparing to, for, for my side sit position. So I need to adjust my base of support here so that I can 
lower the hips into it. We advocate a small pause here just to allow for those changes in blood pressure as we change through the levels. So from side sit, we go into side lying. This is quite critical. All, all transitions come through side sit and side lie. Repairing shoulders, rolling onto tummy. And then initiating that back to side lie, knees up to prevent the roll. Here we are coming onto supine. So I just extend the top leg, allow the hips to naturally roll. And now again, using the natural levers, extending one leg, that knee helps the hips roll. And I come back to my side lie. From side lie, I can then come to side sitting position. Here, back into box. So big shift up with the weight here, preparing the base for support again. And here's the core to use the chair. I'm just gonna pause it here very briefly. Um, if there isn't a chair or a piece of furniture, um, my only means now is to actually use my own leg. So as this knee comes through, that becomes the support from which I push up from there. So without the furniture, I'd be using my own knee. Okay, so that's, that's the buckle chaining approach from sit to floor and back up again. Let's pick this up now. I'm going to look through each link now, uh, very specifically, but with, with stills. Sorry, folks, I've got a, a random show. So in this, in this set of stills, we're going from floor position, okay? So we can see how someone can actually get up from the floor. I'm gonna work through these fairly swiftly because in the next set, we're going to look at the exercises uh, that can skill these movements up. So we can see here in the stills, the demands of each link, what it requires, the ranges of movements that are required at each key joint action. This clearly the most significant part of this after that um, hip lift from box position and I've already seen various uh, uh, questions from you about how we get this knee through, how we bring this first knee through. Let's have a look at the skill up examples. So in the very beginning, if you are in a position where you're leading or teaching exercise, um, notoriously, I think, in strength and balance programs, we, we omit to kind of consider the real importance of mobility training. And as we come through here, you'll see all of the trunk movements, uh, kind of lateral flexion movements, hip mobility, hip walking. All of these are really critical with regards to skilling up this movement sequence. We can only move on to each link once we've mastered the one before that. And if we don't have the mobility and the strength and the power, these, tra these transitions uh, become very difficult, as you're all aware. There is no secret answer. We either prepare people for this, this sequence or we have to think on our feet and be resourceful. Looking here at the key points, um, over and above shoulder mobility is the strength, the wrist strengthening positions here. On the side here, I have a wall press. Sorry, Bex, I'm just gonna jump in. I think we're having issues with your screen. Did you wanna maybe restart your share? Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. No problem, sorry. Any better? Yeah, so I can see your PowerPoint now. Okay. Um, okay, box position here. Again, we've got all the uh, seated trunk mobility requirements, hip mobility, shoulder mobility. Wall press features greatly. Um, if this isn't featuring in your strength balance currently, um, we need to consider that it, it needs to be. So controlling our own body weight through these transitions is critical. Variations of the wall press can help us greatly with that. 
Down here, considerations for pain, uh, painful knit, uh, knees and wrists. Of course. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm going to interrupt this time. Because the people's screens were frozen, they're asking you to go back to stage one, please, on your... This one? Lovely. Okay, starting again then. So this is from, uh, from the floor position, uh, how to get up. Uh, and in this example, I sat myself up against the wall just to get into a, a, a better supported position. So already the requirements are hip flexibility, trunk mobility, um, back extensions, and all of that trunk range of movement. Weight shift onto buttocks here. So the weight shift, I'm using my upper body to support that. Um, hip mobility, this hip walking activity in the chair uh, is really critical uh, around all of these transfers. So even if we're not actually getting backwards chaining in our sessions yet, actually maximizing these opportunities for hip walking and mobility are critical. All paths lead to this, this sequence of skills, even if we're not actually completing all of the links every movement every opportunity with an older person is to at least prepare joint actions muscles and mobility so down this right hand side uh, you can just see any some examples some examples that these aren't the only ones of the key joint actions and and muscles we need to prepare and predominantly here all these ones around the shoulder uh, the wrists here to support the body weight just the, the position of that wrist in itself all replicated in our wall press, uh, wall press variations. If I'm not ready for a wall press, then I'll need some dedicated ring, wrist strengtheners you know, prior to that. So this is all about progression, progressive exercises in order to skill these movements up. Here we come into the, uh, the dreaded four, uh, four point kneel position where, where everyone uh, tells us that their knees are painful or they've had knee replacements and the surgeon has said never to kneel. Well, if we're going to crawl, we need to kneel. Uh, and if you can't crawl, we need another option. And that really is our, our bum walking. I have a short video on that a bit later, but it's essentially the hip walking in a chair, but on the floor. Here, I just want to point out, even if we can't get patients or participants onto the floor, all of these floor-based skills can be done on plinths and beds. So going back to my point about what is the start point, the start point in this skill up may well be these floor transitions. Moving through here, the crawl. This is the critical uh, point here, isn't it? Where we actually need to bring this leg through. There's no easy way around this. Here in this therapy led approach, we show the chair front on. If we turn around to do this sideways, that offers a little bit more range at the hip, but does require a sideways lean to bring that knee through. Just to reinforce, that's not this approach, but certainly in terms of um, um, if you have a, a weaker side or perhaps a, a, hemi, a hemiparesis, you may not, this, this chair front on may not be the solution for you. So a sideways on solution, offers to open a little bit more range through the hips. Then back up to stand. Again here, considerations in skilling this up. We can reduce this, uh, this range of movement as we rehearse this knee lowering with use of uh, cushions and uh, balance pads, etc. But here we can see these extreme ranges of movement that are needed. And this all comes from our fun fundamental mobility and flexibility in preparing people uh, for these sequences. So really paying attention to the detail of, of our exercise components if we're working in exercise settings. Uh, and finally here, so here uh, I'm, I'm kind of showing you with a, a fairly uh, bit of a leap there from, from there to there, but of course we need uh, to be able to stand up fully. So all our rehearsals around our 180 degree turn, our stepping round and our sit to stands are our key features in actually returning to this piece of furniture.
Okay, I just want to look at some uh, extra videos here um, around the things I just mentioned, bum walking and, uh, and sofas. So here is um, another option. Again, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. Here's my hip walk in and out of the chair that we've just talked about, so I need to skill this up. I'm using higher levels. In this example, I've shown, I've shown a longer leg here. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be, if I have two bent legs here, then obviously I have more, more power to help me with this shift up. Um, but if I'm in the right position, if I've skilled up the upper body here, even on a single leg, um, I can give a good shift up to here. And obviously all I'm looking to do here is to create some length in the hips here so I can reach my support. Hips are getting higher than the knees bit by bit. As soon as my knees are higher than my hips, my stand is going to be much easier. Problem solving in action in this video. Okay, I'm going to show you uh, one more video here. This is uh, in the event that there is someone uh, who can help and assist. Key positions again, but this time uh, we've got a helper here who can bring in a piece of furniture, a table that can help with this shift up backside. So I needed much less power and movement there to actually get my buttocks up onto that position. So my key messages in, in all of this, I mean, that really was a, a kind of whistle-stop tool of, of that backward chaining approach. Um, we need to ascertain what is the history of the person. Are they, have they been able to recently get up from the floor? And obviously more questions around that. Um, perhaps they don't know because they've never tried. So we're looking for all of the clues uh, around these ranges of movements and, and other exercises that they may or may not be able to perform in understanding what is their start point to actually start to skill up this movement. Once we have the start point, really it, it's a win-win uh, because we just need to understand and identify what is our starting link and what is required to progress us to the next link. So success is whatever link I'm at, whatever link I can rehearse, um, and I can prepare for the next link. In skilling up, this is gonna be around all our key components of fitness um, and rehearsing the skill. Uh, and there's value also in observing others in their successes, so certainly in exercise environments and settings. Even if people are reluctant to, to try or reluctant to try the next link, we still must keep this on the radar so they can observe this movement frequently. They can gain confidence from, from others' success. Provided we understand what that win-win point is, we must ensure that the link we're trying is going to be successful today. Over and above the requirements of, of mobility and flexibility and strength, these body positions, just understanding what is the next body position and transition that's best going to help me is, is critical. Uh, I'm sure many of you um, have 
experience being in a situation where you've been with a, a friend or family member and in that moment you're just really trying to think through how how I can support this person to get to that next link if we understand that uh, you know how we can use the, the the center of mass and the body's natural levers I've certainly been surprised at how even the most frail of, of adults can actually be talked through these positions. Um, so just understanding what is the best possible position to get into next certainly helps the clarity and instruction to talk someone up. How far can you go? I just want to say that, you know, no one's saying that we must get everyone down to the floor in every session all the first time. It, it's a journey. It's a journey not only of movement, but also of words and confidence and conversations and encouragement. Um, so spending time to, to understand anxieties and, and to kind of nurture these win-wins is how we build confidence. Planning for success, make a plan to talk about it. Um, as Dawn mentioned before, um, we may not be able to, to get everyone up from the floor, but we can at least avoid these long lies that, and, and the consequences of long lies. So, uh, Shamiza, we have a poll, please. Will you consider teaching more older people, even the first few links, even a hip walk, even a bum walk, uh, backward chaining approach as a result of this webinar? Are you just being kind though? Uh, I'd be keen uh, to obviously take uh, all of your questions. Uh, I've, uh, I'm sure there's, there's many there that we can certainly answer after this. Um, Dawn, I'm gonna ask you to, to jump in on this final slide with me if you can. Yes, of course. So essentially we um, would encourage you to come and have a look at our website. We have, got a leaflet that we will hand out to instructors um, who do exercise classes for older people who fall, uh, who've introduced backward chaining into the class. So this is a home version. So people who have successfully completed it in a class can then practice at home. Um, so you can download that for, for free. Uh, we also have a, a, a membership, a free membership option if you want to just come and have a chat with us uh, online anyway. Um, Bex, we've had quite a few questions about arthritis of the knee, whether or they can't bend the knee to a full 90 degrees, uh, and a couple about uh, knee and hip replacements. So um, I'm going to say a few words and then perhaps you could jump in and say a few as well. Yes, of course. Um, this is the most common reason that uh, I'm given whenever I talk to somebody about uh, retraining the skill of getting up off the floor. Um, they, they, most people have sore knees and a lot of people have very sore knees. And some of the discussion I'll have with them privately, not in front of the group, would be um, what do you do if you do fall? Have you found yourself lying on the floor for a long period? And if the answer is yes, um, I have a conversation with them about a short term discomfort to practice the task and make sure they can do it um, versus you know, perhaps a long lie at another time. Sometimes that's actually enough to get them to have a go. Um, the other thing I will try uh, is a, a nice soft pillow uh, underneath. And so you obviously do this on a one-to-one. -one. It's not safe to do that in a class, in a large group, but on a one-to-one, -one, uh, a soft pillow. So as they are going to drop the knee, you put a pillow underneath to give them some padding. Um, I've even had a lady come into my class with uh, skateboard knee pads, which was quite funny, <laughs> but it meant that she felt much more comfortable doing that. Um, I also uh, want to just um, point out that Bex has shown a couple of other ways of getting up without leaning on the knees, but that does require quite strong triceps and, and core strength. Um, so sometimes not, not necessarily the best. Um, before we start talking about uh, replacements, Bex, do you have anything else to add about sore knees? Only that. Um, if we are assuming we're in a role where we can skill this up and plan exercise programs, 
then we need to do the best we can with improving mobility and improving strength at that joint range. So if in context of learning this skill, if knees and wrists aren't ready, then what does that mean to our, to our exercise programs? As Dawn's just said, yes, we can revert to the, the bum walking, the hip walking, but that then assumes that I need to now skill up upper body strength and more specific uh, muscle groups. So if I want to prepare to want someone to be successful, that directly informs what I'm training within my exercise program. If I'm in the moment and I'm reacting to someone who has sore knees or has um, is unable to grip or grasp a piece of furniture, um, that's, a, that's a different situation. And um, I either have to use uh, other resources around me to, to try and raise ultimately those hips above the knees to use elbows rather than hands. Um, sorry to say there is, there is no magic pill if we can skill people up and we have time to do that, we need to adjust our exercise programs accordingly. And if someone is unwilling or anxious about getting to the floor, my line is no problem. Let's do this instead. And for sure it will be an exercise that's supporting progress to that. That's my response, Dawn. Excellent. Um, we've got another couple of questions here. Uh, one client wanted to try, was confident he could, but got stuck once he was on all floors because he couldn't bring his leg through. How would you overcome that? Um, my answer to that would be, if, he, if possible, on all fours, get towards some form of, of chair and then grab hold of your trouser leg and pull it. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there's a much more useful uh, answer from Bex. <laughs> No, there, there's that, there's the assist. So there's the assist whereby I use, um, you know, you ask the person to use their arm to, to assist that leg through. Uh, and as I, I mentioned during the video, rather than a, a front on approach to a piece of furniture, a side on approach can offer a little bit more range at that hip. So with my elbow side on to the chair, with a little shift weight over to the right, I could bring that knee through. I don't know. It depends on the person. Um, the, the the table assist that you saw Dawn and I do. If the person knows that 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 platform is just under their buttock, you'll you'll be surprised that now actually the ask isn't so great, uh, and a little bit of shift up can actually free up some body weight to bring that knee through. Um, there is no one. There is no one solution, but if you have these tools up your sleeve to try, if they can't bring the knee through, I need to, I need to be able to unload that knee and give myself a little bit more range through the hips. So the sideways option could work, but it does mean I now need to shift more weight onto my upper body. Hmm. Okay, we've got um, a query about if there isn't something for them to crawl to or hold on to, such as in the garden. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, most gardens somewhere will have a, a nice solid garden pot or, um, uh, or even a tree to hold on to. Um, I mean, I guess it's, it's uh, just perhaps a conversation with them about, okay, you've, you've had a shock, you're on the floor, um, don't panic, try and stay calm, look around what's around you that's stable that you can hold on to. Um, and actually, Bex, I wonder, as we've got a bit of time, just while I answer some other questions here, whether you can find your video that we did in the kitchen uh, where there wasn't something easy to hold on to, um, or indeed the one where we were pulling ourselves onto a, a cushion and then back onto a chair. Um, so if you just do that while I answer some more questions. <laughs> um, the, uh, we have another question here about... Um, uh, a, a client that had knee replacements is quite sure she'd been advised not to kneel and didn't think she should try for this reason. Again, really quite a common, uh, common concern. Quite often they have been told not to kneel straight away, um, but that doesn't mean that's forever. And obviously a knee replacement's there for a reason, it's to use it. Um, and so uh, my, my general advice 
uh, and it's always best if possible to um, have a conversation with the, the physio that did any rehab is that normally after about six months that knee is quite stable and comfortable or capable of taking weight happily if they've had a hip replacement um, again, we've been doing backward training with people with hip replacements for some time. Uh, and the main thing here is, is again, as long as the hip, uh, the surgery is, is, is healed um, and we uh, are, haven't had any recent dislocations, for example, then there's no reason why they can't do backward chaining. Um, okay, just while Bex is potentially still looking, I don't know if your yeah. screen is uh, no. frozen. To say, um, I don't think I have that video loaded, Dawn, but I just oh, okay. want to make the comment here. Um, so the, the question was, what do I do if I don't have a piece of furniture? Well, in this freeze here, so with this, without the chair, we're, we're basically down to a, a side wall area that I can lean my weight into. Uh, just to give more st more stability and this knee becomes my piece of furniture so I, I do still need to be able to come to a kneeling position to lean against this wall and ideally it would be the outside leg here that would come through but hands on this knee here is is the only other solution and, and, and generally and, and, and as a just as a, a personal opinion really I think people tend to look for something to pull on rather than something to push up. When they're on the floor, they often look and they try to pull up from a position that is almost impossible. They're, they're potentially on their back, their, 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 their feet, they can't get their feet close enough under their buttocks and, and the angles are all wrong. If we can actually get to kneeling position with some support and actually think about pushing rather than looking for something to pull on, um, that in itself may may un unlock uh, a definite shift in in mindset from there when they're looking for their solutions. So um, I have got some other video clips. It might be something that we could post up alongside this after this webinar. I don't know, but um, certainly something that we LLT could could put out there. So yes, if there's nothing to push up from, I need to either create something myself, and in this case, it's that knee provided I have some stability and support. Okay, we've got a couple of questions from people about, um, we've got one about people who have had a stroke uh, and may have hemiplegia and might need modification. To be honest, what we've discussed now, because each individual person who's had a stroke will have different abilities. Um, and so it's, it's a case of working through with that person on an individual basis. My um, great uncle had uh, no use of either, of either of his arms after a very bad road accident. And unfortunately um, for him, uh, reaching mid nineties, he did start falling um, and therefore he couldn't use his arms to assist him at all. Um, however, he kept himself very, uh, very strong, did a lot of exercise, did a lot of sit to stands, had an extremely strong core. Um, and a very strong neck and he would actually um, get himself onto his knees um, move himself across to a chair and use his forehead on the front of the chair and then literally put his bum up in the air by <laughs> by um, getting up onto his on, on one leg and pushing up like you do normally in backward chaining so each individual because stroke patients differ so greatly in their ability I think to be honest that has to be a one-to-one -one basis we also had a question for somebody about amputations. Um, that, that again, unfortunately, is very uh, individual to the to the person. But you know, if they have a, a lower limb amputation, perhaps they could use a, a, a stair technique. You know, moving themselves back onto a, a staircase somewhere or a lower um, a table or something along those lines. Um, it it really isn't possible to give a leaflet or a video to cover every every example. Um, but it, it doesn't take too long to work through with an individual. Um, my my uh, great uncle, it, we spent about an hour at it, uh, working through different ways in which he might uh, best get up again and, and found that. And he used it quite a few times, uh, bless him. 
Um, we've had a couple of questions about people saying, you know, sometimes they just Sorry, guys. I'm actually going to cut, oh. cut off for now just because okay. we're approaching <laughs> just the one more minute mark. And I just do have some final remarks. But um, I do see some questions that haven't been answered. So I will forward whatever questions were an answer to Bex and Don, and then they'll take some time and they'll they'll reply and then I'll, I'll post it on loop. Sorry about that. It's just because I just have a minute left. Um, so I would like to thank our presenters, Don and Bex, for a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful presentation and for sharing your extensive knowledge on this topic. Um, again, you know, we appreciate you guys coming in and taking the time to do this. Um, and also, I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us and engaging in a really great discussion. Um, hopefully, all your questions will be answered. I promise we'll get them to Bex and Don. Um, and just some final remarks. For more information about the Fall Prevention and Community of Practice, um, please visit loop at fallsloop.com. And as a reminder, November is Fall Prevention Month and we all have a role to play. Um, so visit our website for ideas and how you can take action and promote fall prevention in your community at www.fallpreventionmonth.ca. And so when the webinar has ended, it's just going to be in a few, uh, few seconds, you will be re redirected to the Zoom platform and you'll be invited to participate in a short survey. So click the blue, blue continue button on your browser and you'll be redirected to our brief evaluation survey. So we obviously appreciate if you could provide feedback so we can continue to offer high quality webinars just like this one um, in the future. So again, thank you all for coming out and I, we hope that you have a wonderful day and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye.